Welcome to Decode, a podcast that delves into the complex world of K-12 computer science education, highlighting the significance of storytelling in comprehending educational data. Okay, hello and welcome. Good Mike, Rosanna, welcome to episode two of Decode. We're... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's a real pleasure having you. And, uh, and same thing with you, Mike. Uh, I'm going to do a little intro in a moment, but we're going to be talking about race. A little bit of a, you know, some landmines and some uh, some lightning rods here and there, but I think we can get through it. What do you guys think? I'm confident we can get through it. <laughs> a- absolutely, Stan. <laughs> All right. Well, so uh, just as an overview, we're gonna we're gonna be uh, talking about what's preventing computer science access and enrollment. How are schools handling? Some of the pressures of the CS mandates. What role does race play in teaching and learning? So, yeah, just to, to get off the ground, I'm really grateful to have you guys here. Uh, I'm I'm grateful to have you in the, not only in the podcast, but just a growing friendship with each of you. I've really gotten to know each of you quite well over the past few months, and the the things that I'm learning and the the things that we're working on together to try to advance this agenda have been really great. So Roxana, just want to introduce you real quick. You're a recently promoted interim superintendent in Sacramento and we're uh, you're really really very knowledgeable about all of the policy that's going on in California and the big changes there and um, and really in touch with your community. There is a conference happening this week too, right? CALSA is uh, CALS. I, all of these acronyms they kill me. What uh, what is CALSA again? The California Association of Latino Superintendents and Administrators. Uh huh. Yeah, and uh, what what's this? Is, so there's several actually breakouts of that conference, but this this part of it is the uh, focus on results. Is it? It's focused on results, and it's an opportunity to bring teams together to review data um, and explore and ways to address the needs of your districts, your school, your students. Yeah, that's great. And and um, Juan from last week or two weeks ago is the president elect of that organization. So I guess you'll be uh, you'll be seeing him over there. Um, can we take the, the, the title slide off there just so we can see each other for a little bit? And then, uh, and then we've got uh, we've got Mike. Actually, you're flying over there tomorrow as well. I, I should have just flown over with you guys, and we could do the, the the podcast in person, I guess. But yeah, Mike is a uh, a former superintendent in Connecticut, and now the the founder of Agile Evolutionary Group, which is uh, AI and change management. You, so Mike, you've been a leader in AI before it was sexy to be a leader in AI. So, I mean, I guess that makes sense, right? But uh, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, no, uh, thank you, Stanley, for having me on, Roxana. Great to always see you. Uh, I, I, I knew that AI was going to really change the landscape uh, of education uh, roughly about, I don't say before the pandemic, and always looking at how we can explore practices um, incorporate uh, AI into our existing organizational strategies, um, instructional models, uh, and then also prepare our students for the future. And now that we're seeing this explosion of artificial intelligence and generative intelligence and a multitude of different emerging technologies, um, yeah, I guess I was a little bit of Nostradamus daily. <laughs> <laughs> well, you still are a little bit. I, I just love talking with you and getting your your insights. So the the topic today is it's not just race but it's it's about teachers and race of teachers and students as well which we're we're continuously trying to dissect all of this but the the end goal for us is to try to figure out why is this there massive disparity in the enrollment in computer science when it comes to race and gender it's primarily white males in, enrolled in these courses there's a big drop then you see white female, and then there's a big cliff that just drops off. And we're just trying to dissect all of that and, and figure out all of the things that impact that. And today's topic really is teachers. Teachers impact that. And it's it's been 
it's been quite a quite a road for teachers, right? Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute, but you know, the past ten years for teachers has been nothing nothing but change. So I I'm gonna just jump into it, right? And we're gonna throw up a slide. I guess let, let's throw up slide two, and this is a slide that's just talking about self-reported. It's a it's a Merrimack study. And it's about it's self-reported teachers number of hours worked, and it's by race here. And so you see the data: sixty-five hours per week worked by black teachers, fifty-three hours by white teachers, forty-eight by Hispanic. I don't know where I've tried to dig into this. It's general study. I'm I haven't been able to see a breakdown of urban, suburban, rural, or anything like that. Um, but I guess I just wanted to. I, I saw this and it just made no sense to me. And we may all conclude that it also makes no no sense. But yet it's it's here. How how do how do we make sense of this? I'm going to take the opportunity to go first um, because I feel. Um... I feel that there is no validity given my lived experience, given my relationship with many other Latino practitioners in the field, that this is not comparable at all to the the amount of work and time and commitment that it requires to be a teacher alone and then to be a teacher of color um, working through a system that doesn't necessarily cater to you. Um, and so the amount of time and effort required to be seen as a valued educator, as an educator of color, um, I, I disagree with these numbers and I would challenge this research to be conducted in a larger scope because perhaps it was done in a space where the Latino community um, isn't greatly reflected. Uh, as a Latina and um, as a member of my community, I can speak to the work ethic and the hours that we put in above and beyond and not just in education, but in anything that is done um, from a cultural perspective. So I, I just question the validity and the, the source and the pool of educators that were that were questioned and obtained this so, information. From. So, so what if we... I, I don't know. I, I just I look at the numbers and my, I, I I hear you, Roxana. I, I I don't know any any administrators that would say they got where they are by working forty hours a week. I don't know exactly. teachers in general that that do those hours. And, and to your point. I'm not to interrupt, but I will just because this well, that's, that's is what very... we're doing here. We interrupt each other. <laughs> we're talking that conversation. This is a very uh, triggering slide. And I would just say in the profession alone, given the change, the dynamics, the shift and how we have to be um, responsive to the technology and the incorporation, uh, the social emotional supports and learning, the, the extended learning um, programs that uh, we have to provide for, at least in California, the extended days by 30 days beyond the calendar, nine full hours before and after school to ensure students are supported. Um, the the reality of how many, how, how much schools are um, dependent upon to provide supports to students and families through the character, the instruction, nutrition, um, the care, um, just, I, I don't think that this number is accurately reflects or is directly connected to the work that is done by educators in general. And um, I disagree in the ethnic breakdown of how this is reflected. Yeah, it's 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 hard to know. But you know, Mike, when when I first showed you this slide, a uh, number of days ago, I guess, or week, weeks ago, even, I think we, we, we dug this up somewhere. It was, it was interesting because, you know, we all, there, there's another factor as well, right? It, which is, you know, I've, I've, I've not lived it, but I've heard of, of people talk about the black tax, which was described to me as, you know, I'm, I'm 
the one person who looks like me in this environment, in this job, all eyes are on me. I can't afford to make a mistake. I'm representing everybody else that looks like me so that they have a chance to have the same job that I've been given the chance to, to have. So I just got to work harder to, to be able to, to prove myself in this. Is, is there any validity to that? And, I, and I'm kind of wondering, like, Roxanne, you probably expected to see, you know, the, the Hispanic number higher as, as well based on, on your experience. I, 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 I don't know. Yes, yeah, Stanley. Um, you know, when we first looked at those, um, you know, that, that data set and uh, those aggregates were compelling, right? And, and all, all I can do is take a statistical uh, inference about this or make a statistical inference is that, yes, the black tax, right? And there are multiple factors that play into uh, the black tax. You highlighted one, uh, trying to prove themselves, right? Prove themselves that they deserve uh, to be there. Uh, also working more hours just to be able to say, Hey, you know, I can't perform at a high level because, um, me as a, a former black teacher, you know, what we're kind of, I, I like to say the stereotype in education is great in discipline, right. And know how to take, um, uh, know how to be able to manage, cl uh, classroom management, but there's really no, uh, uh, focus around our expertise with instruction, right? And when we think about that, right, as a black male, uh, as black profession, uh, professionals, we have to go that extra mile, right? We have to put in the extra four, five, six hours. And then when you think about it, right, um, if you look at the metric for black teachers, uh, again, I would love to have seen it disaggregated, but, you know, again, this is a statistical inference. Thinking about this in the segregated numbers, I would hypothesize that uh, a lot of the hours are spent in urban uh, centers and uh, urban environments around the country as well. So that requires more time in itself. And you see, uh, and I don't have, again, the research or the uh, data in front of me, but I would infer from a statistical standpoint that the black teachers are clustered in urban environments as well and not seeing many black teachers in rural and suburban environments. Again, this is just a statistical hypothetical or I'm sorry, statistical inference where um, I, I just believe that if we follow those numbers or unwrap those numbers, we would get down to the root cause of um, making correlations and making inferences of why we're seeing black teachers uh, work more hours than our counterparts. And again, that's compelling and it's concerning as well. And as you stated from the outset, the black tax. Literally. Did, did you feel like when, when, you know, in your first job, right, you're working, you felt like harder than others. Did you feel like you were as prepared going into that job as your counterparts? Um, I would have to say now looking at the demographics, uh, sociographics and who were educating Generation Z and Generation Alpha, even back then, uh, more in the lives of Gen Z students, um, to say that I was adequately prepared, I would say no, right? Because when we look at the shifts, uh, black and brown students 50, re represent 57% of education uh, in the United States. That alignment or that corollary, you have to underscore culturally responsive practices. Now, in my teacher prep program, um, there wasn't any courses that focused on culturally responsive pedagogy or what those practices look like, um, the theory and practice and a lot practice apply to each other. So would I say I was prepared? Yes, to a certain degree. No, in the context of who my students were. Do you feel like it's, um, sorry, go ahead, Roxanne. I was, I was, I was just going to ask whether it's different now than it, than it was when, when you guys were training to be educators. I think there's right, more but, receptiveness to an awareness and acknowledgement given the disproportionality rates for exclusionary practices or the lack of engagement, the graduation rates. But just to give perspective on numbers that the National Center of Educational Statistics populated for, the Latino, for white teachers just in general, um, and this is a little outdated, so it would be interesting to see what it is now. But in 2011-12, which was the most recent populated that I was 
just quickly able to reference, 81.9% were white, 6.9% were African-American, and 7.8% were Latino. And so um, if you look at the numbers um, across the board nationally, you would be able to see that, you know, these numbers can speak to the challenges associated to both populations struggling to survive in this in this world of education. Um, and if you look in California, and I'm from California, so I'm going to represent the numbers statistically there, you have 54% of your student population are being Latino, while 20% of your teacher population is Latino, 63 are white, and 3.2% are African American. And so looking at the numbers and the success rates, and, and then the numbers get a little bit more abysmal as you look at superintendents um, that are holding those seats, which is necessary for us to explore this um, further. Uh, if students, if we peel back the layers further to look at student success and how students are progressing through the system, it's easy to see why students wouldn't necessarily want to pursue a career that wasn't inviting and embracing to them. And so those same students in population looking at these percentages um, have to work harder to stay successful, to continue to pursue and fight status quo that necessarily wasn't reflective and supportive of them or members in their own communities, neighborhoods, households. Um, so I think that when I think it's more evident and prevalent now, giving uh, the academic achievement, the need for challenging students to progress through the college and career readiness and the indicators and the matrix that has been established to measure success. So I think it's, it's undeniable um, in the need to engage in these conversations and to put these at the forefront of our conversations because we continue to explore or try new things that aren't producing the desired results. So from the time that we pursued our careers to now, it's an inevitable conversation um, that lives on the forefront, um, not necessarily successfully, but it's- Is it, you know, we're able to have the conversation now, right? Yeah. But it's also what kills me about a, a study like this is they just do these aggregate numbers and right. I don't know about you, but I, I've never seen an average school, right? Like there's- there's all these statistics about the averages. No school is average. There's They're either at one end or the other of, of something. And you look at these numbers and it makes no sense. Uh, you, you have to disaggregate the numbers. But we knew that kind of going into this conversation, right? And we just decided, well, okay, let's use this for uh, some subject matter to, to talk through why the study is probably not really representative of of reality and 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 some deeper questions should be asked. What were you going to say, Mike? Yeah, Stanley. Um, I want to underscore Roxana's um, uh, reference to the data. Roxana loved how you referenced the National Center for Education Statistics. There you go. But when I concatenate right the data metric, uh, just specifically for Black teachers, right, working sixty five hours, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Roxana, um, Black teachers only represent six percent of the, or is it six or is it 8%, Roxanna? 6.8%. 6.8%, 7%. So if you have 65 hours, right, that metric there and representation of 6.8% nationally with teachers. Um, and you look at the other uh, data metrics as well for white and Latino teachers, concerning for black teachers, right? 65 hours and only 6% or 7% of the teacher population in this country, right, are black. So when when I look at those two numbers, again, Stanley, you stated it. I want to underpin that. We have to continuously to unwrap those metrics and really ask hard, descriptive, and catalytic questions to get to the root cause of that quandary. Because that is just statistically uh, disproportionate if you think about it. And then now, if you want to focus on computer science, which we'll probably get in later, and those metrics with black and brown students matriculating successfully into jobs or black and brown people matriculating into jobs in the computer science area, I think we have to be able to address these broad aggregates 
around teachers with representation on really moving computer science and promoting those type of jobs. But again, outside of computer science, I think that those are concerning numbers, specifically 8% with Latinos um, and challenging the Latino hours. And again, I would always define hours because teachers, they work a lot of hours after school and on weekends. And just personally, I was a, a math and science teacher at a high school level. Um, so I, I know for certain, um, to your point, the number of hours were far exceeding the number that was re reflected. But looking and taking it to computer science, I think it's even a greater um, discussion because it. I think um, there was a statistic I came across out of the majors across the state um, there's about 700, I mean, 71,000 majors or graduates throughout the state. Only 8.9% graduated with computer science degrees. And if we look at the statistics of that 8.9%, 13.4% were Latinos, 18.4% were African American. And so if you think about the impact that providing students an opportunity to excel and demonstrate academic and career success um, and not being displaced by people coming in from other states to take jobs that could be available to you in your backyard. With well, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, right? Which is the, the, I forget the number, but it was something like a hundred thousand available computing jobs that are paying $153,000 a year. That's talking about transforming lives and economic mobility and and that's freedom right if if i have the the chance to get this education and get this job and work my tail off to do it that's you know that's the american dream and it's right there and we've got a whole bunch of barriers right that look so I, i'm gonna i'm gonna blow through the next couple of slides a, a little bit quickly but i want to get to representation because mike you've said that a couple of times and and we've talked about it a little bit and uh, you know, I've had my my own experiences around it, and uh, and we talked about it a couple of weeks ago too with Blaine. the 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 next thing I want to talk about, right, is we're we're talking about teachers, and the teachers important because the teachers creating engagement, the teachers the one that's the, delivering the instruction. If the teacher's not happy, or if the, if you're getting a lot of teacher turnover, you you're just shooting yourself in the foot. So let, let's let's pop up just slide four real quick. Which is no the other the the one prior to that, uh, there we go there we go. This is the reasons. T this is teacher turnover. So why why are you going to leave? And it's dissatisfaction, accountability pressure, administrative support, teacher conditions. There are all of these other reasons, but it's I'm not happy in my job, and I I guess I just want to highlight the past ten years, maybe a little yeah. It's about the past ten years. We we had Google Classroom came on, we had uh, inexpensive Chromebooks. And it, until then, there was relatively little change in what was happening in, happening in the teaching profession. And then with the advent of those two things, there was this massive wave of technology change and new products coming into the classroom. And that lesson plan that was, was good for the past 10 years and you thought was gonna be good for the next 10 years, off the table. Teachers had to learn a, a whole new almost a, 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 a whole new curriculum every single year as, as, as new products came in, they're doing PD sessions on, on new products. Then there's new classroom tech. And then you thought you were just kind of getting your breath as a teacher and COVID hits. <laughs> and so now, now you suddenly have to learn how to teach remotely and how to teach hybrid. And there's a whole new set of things and uh, COVID ended, we're all feeling good. And then Mike brings AI onto the stage. And now we've got this in front of us as well. So I, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there to say, isn't it pretty damn hard to be a teacher right now? And over the past 10 years, I mean, it's no wonder this is, you know, such a big number of why things change. We can take that down. Well, I think uh, it's a... The teacher shortage is a reality uh, everywhere and finding teachers, um, keeping teachers and and 
while maintaining those accountability standards to ensure academic success is a juggling act. Um, and in some cases, uh, you know, we have teachers and individuals who are not appropriately trained nor prepared, um, but we need them to to support and and fill the classrooms. Um, and we definitely had the opportunity to rethink education. And I wonder how many of us really took advantage of that uh, and of those opportunities to restructure um, how we engaged, how we provided instruction, how we supported our teachers to be innovative for students' growth. Yeah, because administrators, I'm sure, were stressed out as well. Mike, what do you think? Of the, do, you, do you want to pop up that last slide on on on, res, on kind of f feeling respected um, by race? Let's see, it was slide three, I think. What do you think of of this slide? I I found this hugely interesting. Let's, I mean, for the audience, let's just ignore the the yellow one. That's prior year. The blue bars are are this year's percentage of teachers who feel that the general public respects them and their and their profession. So, you know, Stanley, I wanted to, you know, talk about the dissatisfaction and it segues nicely into this slide. I always like to uh, part and parcel it into two phenomena, right? Structural factors. When we look at that first uh, metric for dissatisfaction, um, uh, 55%, right? So I look at it from a structural factor from the standpoint, um, resources, right? COVID, the applications from COVID, um, you know, asynchronous, synchronous learning, different models, right? Those are all uh, contributing factors, structural factors. But I like to say that the education um, influencing factors, right, of when we look at dissatisfaction, specifically linear to black teachers, um, black and brown teachers too, uh, we'll put them in the cohort, is that uh, w when, you, when you think about the support, right? And I wanna highlight that word support for black and brown teachers. Um, there really isn't many internal supports. Usually you might be the one or the only or one of one or two within uh, a, a school, let's per se, let, let's say that. And if it's just one or two, you really don't have enough, right? A, a strong sample size to develop uh, internal affinity groups. When you see black teachers leave, when you see brown teachers leave, it's the fact that they feel isolated as well. And then they're overworking, right? When we talk about the black and brown tax, overworking many hours to prove themselves because there's really no one that they can relate to. So when we talk about culturally responsive um, practices and instruction for students, we need to be able to metabolize culturally responsive systems for black and brown teachers and leaders within the learning organization. Um, so, or learning organization. So when I look at this and coupling that with the data visualization from the last uh, slide, we have to take in consideration that Sometimes our black and brown teachers feel isolated. Sometimes they feel independent and alone. And that right there can lead to dissatisfaction because there's nobody that can relate to them from a professional sense, from an educational sense, right? They're bringing their own cultural norms into the school. Are they being supported by other teachers and other administrators as well? So, you know, we really have to look at those aggregates and disaggregate them down into independent data variables so we can interrogate those data variables to ensure that teachers, black and brown teachers, feel supported. You know, when we look at the level of respect, black and brown teachers are respected because if you work at 65 hours, then you're trying to gain respect, environmental respect uh, within your learning organization or school. So we really have to keep disaggregating and interrogating these metrics to answer the root cause question, why? Yeah. And well, what's we can take uh, this interesting number. on that graphic that was displayed, all of them demonstrated increase from 2022 to 2023. So something shifted during that period in time. Um, and perhaps it's just a sign that we're returning out of that online platform and, and that also contributes to less isolation just on a just a general 
notion looking at the trend for all groups moving forward are moving yeah that's the the good news is the trend certainly is positive across the board and stanley in and to underscore what roxana stated and why i think and again this is a statistical inference is because you're hosting conversations like this now right now there are policies and there's legislation that is targeting black and brown teachers right uh, targeting students at the early onset uh, to have this level of introduction to computer science and the future of work, AI, generative AI. So conversations that were taboo before COVID, right? Now in the after COVID stage, the AC stage of education, as I always highlight it, now we're looking at how we can intentionally create these groups, these affinity support groups for our teachers, black and brown, uh, there's a strategy now, national and state strategies to recruit and retain retention around black and brown teachers as well. And just furthermore, that sense of belonging and while the opportunity to leverage AI and technology, um, but the importance of the social interactions may also be just um, equally important and have an impact on how we feel supported through our professional and get interactions. Well, I, I want to move on to representation because it's it's a it's a big topic, and it's it's uh, it's an interesting one for me, especially. And and I, I guess I want to kind of I've had the benefit of hearing you guys talk about representation because it's not something I've really had to think about or or talk about in in my life, but now it's really you know, it's, it's, it's at the forefront of, of this big problem in, in enrollment. And I want to kind of just share sort of, sort of some of my perspective and, and hear kind of what you guys lived and kind of what your, what, what drove some of your aspirations. And, and I'm, I was just reflecting, we, we talked about this a little bit, but a couple of weeks ago, when we did the podcast, Blaine Watson, was talking about his experience as a principal and he was trying to really provide a good computer science course. And he was very, very fortunate to find a great computer science teacher who was using gaming and coding games to create a high level of engagement for the students. That teacher was black and that was significant for Blaine. And he was talking about, I'm, I'm going to do anything I possibly can to retain this teacher because the, the kids are engaged. They love this guy. It's awesome. And I, and I think back to kind of my experience and my teachers and the vast majority of my teachers were, were white. If I had a, a good teacher who is a, a different ethnicity, I would be really just, it didn't matter to me. I just wanted it. Uh, I, like I would be thrilled if I had that teacher that Blaine had uh, when he was a when he was a principal in his school, and and so for for me I didn't I, I didn't really have that experience. But then you know as we started digging into the representation thing, I I just really was questioning. Well, would I choose not to take computer science or some other subject because the teacher didn't look like me or was a different race and for me that's it's not the case but uh but for a lot of kids out there you guys are, are are saying pretty strongly that that is the case and not only is that the case but there's a big inspiration factor and and i guess i, I would love to start with both of you kind of why why did you pursue your careers you know what 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 was that and what what were some of the sort of the factors and, and mike you you talked about kind of what inspired you to be a superintendent? I'd love to hear that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I always say, here's another acronym for you, Stanley and Roxana. Uh, R-R-M, right? R-R-M. Representation and relationships matter, right? And when we think about students, um, you know, relationships is core, it, it, it's foundational for academic success. And I didn't have a black or brown teacher, um, sad to say, until graduate school. 
And I, I never had that representation through the K-12 um, vertical and even four years in college. So the rationale why I wanted to become a teacher was because I didn't want any black or brown students, specifically uh, black and brown females and males. I don't want them to not have that same lived experience of not having a black or brown teacher until graduate school. Uh, I tell you the reason why I wanted to become a superintendent because the district where I was a teacher at, um, my superintendent was a black male. And I, w and I remember uh, my first week when I saw him, uh, Dr. Reginald Mayo, I, I said to myself, I want to be a superintendent just because of him. Didn't even know what a superintendent was. And so I said, I want to be like him. And just imagine if I would have a black or brown teacher, right? Male or female, doesn't matter going up through uh, the K-12 vertical, I, I think that I would have I would have had deeper relationships um, with my teachers. And also, I think I would be I would have been more engaged. And what I mean by engaged is authentically engaged. Um, there was that level of strategic compliance. I want to do the work to get the A, but was I truly engaged as a student, authentically engaged? I, I don't I don't think so. So when we look at Generation Alpha, Generation Z today, 57%, I believe, of our students by 2025 are going to be black and brown. I think we need to intentionally have representation to strengthen relationships and to have a teacher like Blaine who had a black male computer science teacher. Wow. Just imagine if I would have had that at the middle school um, uh, sector. I might have went in computer science originally, engineering originally, because that teacher looked like me. I, I would have had a successful career, right? But I mean, but that's the type of impact and influence teachers can have. And if there's representation in front of me that is a classroom practitioner that is black or brown, underscore computer science, wow, I'm going to be engaged in that. And maybe the influence or the impact would be. I want to go into computer science because uh, Mr. Jones uh, is a computer science expert. He's teaching me how to build games and models. Well, uh, Ro Roxana, you you had some different rationales around what you saw around you as you were growing up. Well, so as a student, um, I can say that I did not see myself reflected in teachers. I also did not feel seen by teachers. I was invisible. And it wasn't until I pursued my administrative credential. I just have to say that that's, it's, it's painful to hear that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, I can say that I had a supportive family and I watched my family struggle in different areas. Um, and I thought that if I can make an impact in education, maybe the outcomes of some of my loved ones would have been different. And so I always led through that. And, you know, that may be a different topic for a different time. But I can say that um, when I was teaching, I was teaching, so I was credentialed to teach science. And at the time, I was able to use my emergency credential to teach math as well. But I was pursuing my math supplemental. And um, I just needed two classes, but I signed up for six units because that was the minimum. And in, I took the math class and I took uh, a course that was curriculum design. And it was um, a class for individuals pursuing their administrative credential. And it was composed of individuals wanting to advance to their administrative pathways. And I realized at that moment where the mindset was, it was a predominantly group of white uh educators pursuing administration and I thought and I was pretty young in my career like wow these people could be my direct supervisor as principals of a school and their vision their values their beliefs and attitudes about children and families um, did not match mine so I explored um, a, a program at that particular college and it was an urban cohort and it was a cohort of educators that you had to apply to be a part of. 
that was for providing change in urban settings. The teachers that made up this program were all black and brown, very passionate driven change agents. And uh, it has established a strong foundation for how I desire to lead. Um, and it made a foundation so impactful that it's it's my commitment and my return to that group that currently no longer exists because the person who led it passed and she took on a lot of um, heavy battles to continue to make sure that it was in place. But when she passed, it was easy to dissolve. Um, and so as a leader in this setting, there have been times where uh, I was that one amongst predominantly white uh, colleagues. And I always saw things differently. I saw how the decisions that we were making and the choices that were being um, selected for systems or practices, how hurtful they were because I witnessed firsthand or had direct experiences associated with the results of those choices. And it required me to seek out an outside group, which was Kelsa. And this was back in 2010. And had it not been for me finding myself reflected in what was possible and 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 feeling normal in my thinking and or my perspective, I would have left this profession back then because that was how isolating and how different I felt as a leader. And um, it's why I continue to give my time to support others who may be struggling in the same way. And so uh, the, the opportunity to have been seen as a student to be successful did not happen until I was in that administrative group and as a professional, it wasn't until I sought out those circles for support, encouragement, and validation that it's okay to be alone in that space because I'm not alone when I'm in the collective. And and it's hard work, and it's personal, and it's overwhelming, um, but it's worth it because I feel that it's my responsibility to advocate and, and lead. And sometimes our passions kind of interfere with the delivery um, and, you know, in these low numbers, if we've looked at the statistics for superintendents within the Latino and the African American populations, 7.7% of superintendents in California are Latino and three times more, that's a number three times greater than the number of superintendents of African American descent. And so, and then with the ability for the politics to influence the decision to keep, promote, or release superintendents that may not see things or are willing to call out things that are not benefiting students um, becomes an even greater challenge. And so when you're looking at foundational structures that are harmful to students, and then you throw in you know, other pieces, it, it's hard to get to the computer science. Um, but you know, maybe if we shifted our mindset, that computer science is not for an ad advanced elite group of students. Maybe computer science is for an intervention group of students where it could be the engaging and treating piece to hook and connect students to an educational platform. But, you know, the battles are so great. Sometimes we can't even get to, to those pieces that are a direct impact on students that could change the trajectory of their lives. I think this is why I love you guys so much is you know, you are leaders who serve. And that's the ethos that was driven into me when I was in the military. And I just can't imagine having ha having to wait all through your entire academic career. I mean, your childhood academic career and then into your professional career to really start getting those those fruits of the the labor and so i just really really want to give you guys really some big kudos for wow that's really it's really impressive and uh really admire you both for 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 that path i'm we're we're, we're about out of time and i want to give you guys both a chance to kind of give a positive message to to, to leave everybody with of of maybe kind of you know where we go from here uh i want to mention just Real quick, just about the podcast, please, people watching, please subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube. And if you like what you're hearing and 
and and how, how how we're having these discussions, please leave us a nice review. We will record uh, a new episode every two weeks with a slightly different theme. And very soon, through a partnership we're going to have with Global Ed, teachers and administrators are going to be able to get some continuing education units for participating in these podcasts, as well as our Pi Top uh, Pi Top uh, teaching webinars. So. With that little uh, sound bite plug, I wanted to give you guys each, maybe Mike, you want to leave us with uh, some some nuggets of, of wisdom, truth, and optimism. Yeah, yeah. Thank you um, for the conversation, Stanley and Roxana. And I, I, I think, Stanley, when we look at education now, right, uh, we have platforms like this where we're having very, very hard I like to say uncomfortable and complex discussions around race, around equity that can create um, tension among people. And I think that, you know, we're highlighting some of the uh, gap areas. So we, we need to deepen, right? Deepen and strengthen platforms like this daily, more conversations uh, universally and nationally to be able to occur um, so that teachers do feel supported, right? Uh, when I think of computer science, you know, again, uh, I, I, introducing computer science to kids uh, at the early onset, right? Early childhood education, kindergarten, having it be a part of the curriculum, integrated into the curriculum, highlighting the importance of developing core competencies uh, for the future is essential, right? Is right now. When we talk about jobs, uh, thanks for the data for that, Roxana and Stanley. Uh, there's going to be 600,000 new computer science jobs by the year 2030. IT, there's going to be uh, roughly around 300,000 new jobs. So it behooves us to redesign, restructure, look at new architectures of instruction and systems so that now we're introducing computer science to our students at an early onset. Moreover, now that the demographic is 57%, we have to now focus on computer science education for black and brown students as well, because they are going to be our future engineers, our future software um, engineers and software designers, a part of IT, uh, doing robotics as well as gamification, all of that, right? Um, we have to really continue and deepen this, and this is a great start, Stanley. So now is how we can expand the ecosystem, expand this network, and have a true network effect in the context of learning. And um, I'm actually happy, Stanley, that you are actually putting this out there and strengthening the conversation around some critical issues where a lot of people wouldn't touch, specifically white men and, and women. So thank you, Stanley, for uh, opening this up. So this is positive and this is creating optimism in education. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Roxana? Well, I would just say that Mike said many things that um, resonate with me as well. But I would just say um, take a chance on allowing students to be learners side by side with your students. There are platforms, and I had a brief opportunity to explore what, what your program offers and the ability for students to problem solve, if we think through math and science as problem solving opportunities and inquiry based learning, um, computer science on many levels offers that opportunity to students and uh, opening ourselves to the potential that students may be able to, you know, maybe it's facilitated instructional opportunities and putting the responsibility on the students in a way that is engaging early on for the desire to pursue opportunities later and not making it so that it requires um, a student who's in calculus to pursue a computer science pathway. Sometimes these pathways can be very and restrictive, but allow for that discovery, allow for, you know, maybe yeah. not advanced education, but career pathways and, um, you know, take a chance. And I think that we would, we would learn that students are probably more capable of advanced learning within the technology than, than we give them credit for. Well, I, I love that. And certainly we're going to have to dig into that a little bit more deeply because 
you know, the framework for a lot of computer science legislation doesn't say coding. It says computational thinking, which is problem solving. And computer science touches every single area of our lives. There's no reason we shouldn't have it touching every single curricular area within schools. So thank you again, Mike and Roxana, for joining me today. This was a great conversation, as always. And let's go out there and make some change. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks again, Stanley. See you tomorrow, Armana. <laughs> See you. Thanks for listening. If you found this conversation valuable, please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We will see you next time on Decode.